bridges to prosperity. Sometimes when we use that phrase, we're talking metaphorically, but sometimes we're absolutely not. Avery Bang builds actual bridges, mostly footbridges, that can be the difference between rural isolation and access to health care, education, and markets. Her organization, called Bridges to Prosperity, imagines a world where poverty caused by rural remoteness no longer exists. And she actually teaches communities how to build their own footbridges over wild rivers and gorges in partnership with local organizations and professionals. I had a chance to ask Bang about her bridges this November in New Orleans at TED Women, at an extraordinary annual gathering of women visionaries, and not just visionaries, but bridge builders of the very real rope and lumber sort. Here's Avery Bang. There are over one billion people in the world that lack safe access. And so if you kind of break that down, that's one in seven people that literally live in a walking existence and cannot get to where they need to go. The people that actually live in the areas where we all rely on our food supply and or just the majority of the population in the world, they're living at the ends of the tips of the leaves on the trees in the forest. And I think as opposed to looking at transportation networks only from the trunk out, it's incumbent upon us to think about how do you get sustenance from the outside in. I think a lot of planners forget what's happening in the rural last mile. So really what's at the very ends of where everything is sourced and coming from or needing to get to also could be called the first mile, depending on where you think of your source of origin. And I think that that's actually the most interesting. It's the coffee you drink in the morning. Where does that actually come from? It's not actually coming from the regional center on the coffee bag. Um, and when you're a community health worker, whether you're in a rural place in Montana or rural Uganda, you're actually responsible for reaching that rural last mile. And I think that if we could start to think in planning terms of how to connect all of the people, uh, we'd be, all be better off. We believe that that infrastructure in the pedestrian world, where people live with literally the very least, is the highest rate of return. So whereas we would absolutely build anything in a transportation infrastructure suite, pedestrian infra infrastructure has the highest rate of return. A bridge is an equalizer. Everyone can equally use that public service um, to access the, thing, the goods and services that already are there. Peru, I think, like many developing countries, is um, such a huge percentage of the population walk to school, they walk to whatever farm or work jobs, um, they're walking to a medical clinic. And so in that space of walking, there's a tremendous inequality between people who live close to the services that exist and those who live on even the, the fairly near outreaches of that urban center. Um, so when I arrived in Yavina, Peru, it's a community of maybe 600 people, but 300 of whom live on the other side of some type of river. Just experiencing firsthand how different the lives of people were who happen to live on this side of the river versus that side. And it has this quality to it where it's like, you can see it, but you can't have it. That seemed just so unjust at some level. What really struck me was um, I wasn't going in and trying to change anything culturally or even in some level trying to change a, a system that I didn't yet understand, but putting in built environment infrastructure help to at least make sure everyone in a tertiary area had access to the goods and services that did already exist. Get their goods to market, to send their children to school, to get their mothers to have attended births. Um, we have some really interesting data coming in uh, about how bridges affect education. We found in a three and a half year longitudinal study that in communities that received a bridge, there was a 30% higher um, increase in household level income. And so that's at the household level attributable to one bridge. Um, in, in Nicaragua that translated to these bridges roughly paying for themselves over five times over in the first year alone. And what's interesting is that's not all taxable income, but just in terms of the new economic activity in a community, five times over whatever it would have cost. But bridges last for 30 years. And so we believe that even though a pedestrian bridge might not solve all of the world's problems, it will be one of the ways that you can start to create more economic prosperity in rural areas. We really believe strongly in the principle that this should be a community-driven entity and project. Um, 
So working through and with whatever hierarchical structure or governing structure is really important. Understanding really what are your challenges? Really why would you want to have access? What would that give you? What percentage of your population would care about that? And, and really trying to dig into the why. And once we understood concretely this was a major game changer for this community, then we move forward into the, and then how can you help? The nearest place that you could drop materials was over a three hour hike. So for those materials that were brought in, you had to be imagining walking down a mountain and through a valley, 80 pound bags of cement, that's two meter long pieces of timber, that's uh, steel rebar, digging anchor pit holes big enough to replant big trees, but you're doing it by hand, and um, getting cables across rivers using just really simple, like how do you get someone to swim across the river? And how do you get them to have a rope tethered to their stomach so you can get the first rope across? So you have to use a lot of ingenuity and creativity uh, as well as engineering. To date, we've built 270 bridges um, serving nearly one million people. So it's, uh, it's an evolution. I think my first bridge in Peru, I looked at very differently than now I look at how do we build many, many more bridges? Um, and how do we make an impact that's far greater than just saying what's done and it's there, but really what's the systems change that we're creating while we build these projects? So we believe there are about 100,000 locations where a bridge is a high need priority uh, investment. I live in the River North Arts District in Denver, and there's a river that cuts through just to the south of the intersection of the two most prominent interstates. So when Interstate 70, going from the airport to the mountains, came, cut through uh, originally, it isolated this community called Globeville. Globeville is predominantly a Latino population. Um, in the history of Denver, it was fairly industrial, and uh, families that have been there for generations helping really grow the economy but that have largely been left behind, and they're not even able to access the new um, transportation development that is happening. For example, a light rail to go out to the airport or go down to good jobs, and there they are, of course, forgotten again. And that community continues to be the lowest um, levels of income and education in the entire urban uh, city, but it's within sight distance from the highest growth in urban development. So we've been working on a bridge project and it will be completed for just under half of what the, the city originally budgeted because we have a more lean infrastructure approach. Um, so we believe that this bridge will be an equalizer for them.